kings and queens, it's Aiden Lee, and I have a lot in store for you guys today. Did you hear last night the Toronto Raptors beat the Atlanta Hawks and came through with yet another win? So if you don't stand the Toronto Raptors, take several seats. So to fill us in on all the deets, here's our very own Stephanie Liu. The Toronto Raptors led the Hawks all four quarters of the game and came out on top with a final score of 124 to 108. In this game, the Raptors had a 53.3 field goal percentage, 55 rebounds, 19 turnovers, and 33 assists. The top scorer of the game for the Raptors was Jonas Valanciunas, who scored 24 points. Not only are the Toronto Raptors first in the Eastern Conference, but they are 15 and four and have the best record in the NBA. When the team started winning and making the playoffs consistently, that's when you start seeing the surge of fans because for so long we were so bad and we had the fans and people wanted to watch us and wanted us to be good, but they were just waiting for something good to watch. We got guys that are great defenders and great three-point shooters. And in the NBA now, you need to have defense and three-point shooting. So adding Kawhi Leonard and Danny Green, and getting rid of someone like DeMar, who's a mid-range shooter, that just makes our team set up more for the modern NBA today, which is why we're, we're clicking so well so early. This team should be able to make the finals. And if we do and lose, that'll be seen as a success. And if we win it, then we win it. Although he was in an Atlanta jersey, last night was a big night for former Raptors player Vince Carter. The 41-year-old made a buzzer-beating slam dunk giving him 25,000 career points. The next Raptors game will be played this Friday at Scotiabank Arena against the Washington Wizards. Here with your Raptors news, I'm Stephanie Liu. This month, Toronto music group Rose Town released their R&B music video for their single, Lord Have Mercy. Our girl Sarah Decudo sat down with one of their members, Bowman Reed, to talk about Rose Town and 90s nostalgia. Thank you so much. Hi, Bowman. Thanks for coming into the studio Thank with you me for today. Thank you having me. Perfect. Uh, so this month, you and your friends Taryn Kim and Eden Graham have released your debut music video called Lord Have Mercy. Mm -hmm. uh, and you guys have formed the group Rose Town. Yes. Lord have mercy. So I guess I just want to ask, how did Rose Town come to fruition? Um, so basically, Taryn and Eden are my two best friends. Um, and whenever we would get invited to a party, if you put on uh, Bruno Mars' album, 24 Karat Magic, we would explode on the dance floor. We would go crazy. We knew all the steps. People would get annoyed with us because we just like danced like and stole the entire focus. Um, and I basically went to them and said, guys, we love this. Why don't we try to make our own type of um, nostalgic song? And that's exactly what we did. So what was the process of creating the song like then? Um, it was long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, one day I was waiting for the train. It was like negative 20 degrees outside. And I was standing there and I said to myself, Lord have mercy. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, that's the title of our song. So then I went to them and said, this is the title. Um, and basically, I, uh, I didn't know how to make music before this. So I was determined to like make, learn how to make music, did that. Um, and then we basically got together and wrote the song. Um, and then we recorded it. Uh, it was a very long process, but 
it was a big learning curve. Right. And what was the actual process of learning how to make that music like? Um, from nothing all the way to yeah. the finished product? I actually, okay, I lied to you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I used to make music when I was like younger, but it was just like loops, like placing loops in, you know, spots. Um, but like learning how to actually like make uh, music was just really interesting because you, you want to make music that sounds like you didn't make it. You know what I mean? Mm. So it was learning how to like balance that that was very difficult, but also very, very fun and very rewarding because I had never done anything like it before, and it's a good song. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you uh, co wrote, directed, and edited for this project. Yes. All while being a student in university. So, yeah. was that a difficult balance at all for you? Or? Um, yes. <laughs> I think that it was just difficult. The worst part about it was finding time um, with. Eden and Taryn, like the rest of Rose Town, to like actually shoot, um, because not even shoot, record, right? Just getting together was so hard because we all go to different schools. Um, but yeah, it was definitely hard. That's why part of the reason why it took so long to make it. Perfect. So, what makes Rose Town unique compared to other music groups in Toronto? Um, definitely our sound. We are definitely not. Um, I don't like current music. It's not what I listen to. I'm not a trap guy. Like, I listen to a lot of like older uh, 80s into the 90s R&B and uh, New Jack Swing, which is the type of era that we uh, emulated. Um, so I feel like no other person or group in Toronto or that I know of is really doing that. Mm -hmm. So obviously that 90s nostalgia is kind of um, a big wave currently in modern fashion and obviously for you guys in, in Rose Town. Mm. Um, so why did the 90s and that aesthetic and that era inspire you so much? Um, I'm not sure. I, I really like, I think that as a genera I think it's a, genera a generational thing to enjoy um, an era that you weren't a part of and to like miss that and uh, to enjoy a, an era that like reminds you of your parents. Um, 90s music reminds me of my dad a lot because when I was growing up, uh, whenever I would drive anywhere, like this is the music that I would play. Or if we went to like um, a Christmas dinner at you know Uncle Victor's house, this is the music that would be playing. Um, so I I don't know what it is about nostalgia in the 90s that's coming back right now. But I, and I think that there's a big comfort level to it because you know you watch all these shows on television and you see how they dress like Saved by the Bell or the Cosby Show and like, I'm literally wearing a Bill Cosby sweater <laughs> right now. So like I feel like it's like a comforting thing to to want to relate back to a different time. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us in the studio today, Bowman. I wish you and Rose Town all the success in the yeah, future. Thank you for having me. For Toronto Today, I'm Sarah Decuto. Back to you, Aiden. Oh, this track is hot. If nothing takes me back more than a 90s heartthrob, you definitely need to give it a listen. Did you know that four kilometers away from downtown Toronto, there is an exclusive neighborhood that very few can move into every single year? But our user Javed found a way and she is taking us as her plus one. Let's go. Toronto, almost 3 million people, 1.3 million cars, and 2,586 high-rise buildings and counting. Only four kilometers away from the heart of downtown Toronto is this. Life on the island is a unique experience. There's no major roads, no grocery stores, and a school that only runs to grade six. But a community of 650 people have found a way to make it home. I guess you have a more positive state of mind being here. Andrew Hild grew up here. He left the island to go to school in Toronto. He then came back to work in a local tavern in order to be a part of the community, which brought him up. It's a great community, you know, everyone knows each other. I've grown up with, you know, they're all my best friends here. And so yeah, it's very chill, very relaxing. Andrew is not alone in his love for the island. There's currently 262 houses and 500 people on a purchasing list some who've been waiting over 20 years for an opportunity to live here. I mean, you're living on an island, right? Like, 
where you don't have to worry about stoplights and like and constant traffic of cars and pollution and you know it's it's cleaner, which I like. While the list has been capped for the past 20 years, the first 100 people are allowed to bid on houses for sale here. About three new people are able to buy property here each year into the community where everyone knows everyone on a first name basis. It is an aging community and because of the wait list and because how long it takes to move your way up the wait list, uh, there's, an, there's a an unusual proportion of older people. Of the three major islands forming the Toronto Islands, residents live on wards and Algonquin Islands. Homes here did not always look the way they do. During World War II, what began as a fishing and tent community transitioned into winterized homes in the midst of the city's housing crisis. If you go for a walk on wards or Algonquin today, many of the small houses you see are the original structures built from that time. We're very lucky. We had you know, a house on Algonquin and it's big enough that we were able to sort of split it into two apartments. So my mother still lives on, in one part and my daughter and I live in the other. From the 1960s, islanders fought for over 30 years to save their houses from being demolished in favor of Parkland. Finally, in 1993, legislation was passed to allow residents to purchase 99-year land leases from a land trust. While residents own their homes, this land is under a long-term lease that runs until December 2092. And I think you might find people in the community who said, I'm a prisoner of my house because what the house is here sell for is no longer enough to go and buy a condo in downtown Toronto, for example. On the island, I wake up to like the sound of birds and, you know, like just wild animals rustling about and it's a nice breeze and I don't hear any of that. And that's like, you know, it's hard to put a price on that. Life on the island does have its obstacles. The only motorized vehicles you'll find here are garbage trucks, snow plows, and service vehicles. Besides two large clubhouses for community events, an open to public tavern, and a fire station, there's no other public services here. You have to think ahead. There's a lot of forward planning in living over here and being organized. And that's something that just you build into your life after a while. And if you're not comfortable doing that, then this is not the place for you. To get even the simplest of household items involves a 12-minute $8 ferry ride to downtown Toronto, which runs on a limited boat schedule. And missing the last ferry boat at 11.30 p.m. means finding a private water taxi is your only way of getting home. For example, there was one year the kids were playing hockey, their game was at 6 a.m., there's no boat at 6 a.m. in the morning. So you have to hire the water taxi at 4.30 in the morning to come and take you to the hockey game at 6 o'clock. Residents all agree that it's not the easiest life, but Susan sees them as inconveniences more than challenges. It is a little unusual, you know, uh, 10 minutes away from the downtown of Canada's largest city. Yeah, But it's part of its charm. Despite relying on this boat every single day to get in and out of the island, Susan and the other residents all agree they wouldn't want to live anywhere else. For Toronto Today, I'm Yusra Javid. Okay, I had a lot of fun with you guys today, but I need to find my way to get on this island. For Toronto Today, I'm Aiden Lee. Back to you guys in the studio.